Bienvenue à Paris, and to this special edition of the daily podcast episodes, bringing you the inside stories from the Paris 2024 Olympic Games. Allez, allez, allez. Here's your host, John Gregory. A warm welcome to this first episode of this special daily series. Thanks for joining me. We will be bringing you a short daily episode as we guide you on what to expect the next day at the Olympic Canoe Slalom and Kayak Cross in Paris and recap on the results from the last day's racing. I will be joined by guests, including Olympic paddlers, teams and race commentators from around the world. Just to explain, the name CDG is the Airport Code of Paris. So opening thought, the Tokyo Olympics marks the first and only time that France hadn't been on the Olympic canoe slalom podium. With the legacy of three-time Olympic champion Tony Estonguet, who we have been proud to see as president of the Paris Organising Committee, should we expect a latest French canoe slalom champion on the Vassaman course? Today we will preview what to expect. I'm joined by American Olympic champion Joe Jacoby and Irish Olympian Mike Corcoran. Both talk about relishing that minute on the start blocks before the countdown sounds. We have so much to share. Four athletes have made their fifth Olympics. They are Luca Jones from New Zealand, Marlin Chiro from Spain, Peter Kauser from Slovenia and Takuya Hanida from Japan. There are also five athletes who have made their fourth Olympics. They are Jess Fox from Australia, Anna Satila from Brazil, Casey Eichfeldt from USA, Sidris Tassiadis from Germany and Benjamin Savsek from Slovenia. They have seven Olympic medals between them. Eleven athletes have made it to their third Olympics, including world number one Jiri Priskovic from the Czech Republic, plus 26 two-time Olympians and 38 taking an Olympic appearance for their nation for the very first time. Let's start with two-time Olympian Joe Jacoby. Joe, uh, wonderful to have you uh, back on the podcast. Again, you've been a long-time supporter. Thank you. What do you think has changed in canoe slalom broadly since Tokyo? It's not lost in me that it's only been three years, not four years. And I I think that probably had an effect on, on some of the athletes that were may have thought that 2020 was going to be their last Olympics, but when they went on to train for another year for 2021, I mean, I can't speak specifically for some of the athletes that have hit that five Olympic mark that you had here on the podcast, but I imagine for some of them that that was a, a factor. And then the other thing that changed in the landscape is I think the development, the progression of kayak cross. It's opened up new opportunities for athletes. I think it created different pathways to the games, which is is nice to see in a sport like ours. And I think watching that progression over the next few years is going to be interesting. It's hard to imagine that we're not going to see more specialization you know, in women's canoe, women's kayak, uh, kayak cross, I don't know how long that this all the crossover is going to stay as it has been. I mean, I think there's an, some incredible opportunity for specialization uh, in the next uh, one to two Olympic cycles. Yeah, absolutely. I think it is going to be over a couple of Olympic cycles. And I mean, in all fairness, I mean, C1 women is still a newer uh, Olympic uh, discipline as well. And we're seeing that, I think, probably get more more established at the same time. Absolutely. Absolutely. So. Yeah, be, I think those are sort of the some of the bigger um, evolutions that I've seen since Tokyo. And I'm really excited to see how uh, how the sport kind of lands in Paris. And I guess one other thing that comes to mind relative to your question is that it's not lost on me that the president of the Paris Olympic Games is one of the greatest solemn athletes of all time. Like, I think it's really neat to see Tony Estangay in, in that leadership position. And uh, that that's been really neat every every time you see the president of an olympic games post something you're like oh that's that's that guy that i used to compete with of course i i, I see tony from time to time when i'm running on the running trails in po and we pass each other and catch up just for a quick you know conversation out, out in, on the trails that's a really neat thing to see one of our own in, in that in that position of, of leadership could see one of his kids competing by 2028 or 2032 Actually, it's funny you say that. You know, it was just two years ago that we were celebrating the uh, 50th anniversary of the 72 Olympic Games at the World Championships in Augsburg. 
incredible experience to have been at that race in Augsburg. That was a part of this last Olympic cycle as well. And of course, you know, I was sort of thinking ahead to, I know this is crazy, to 2042, when it'll be the 50th anniversary of the Laseo Olympic Games. Got to presume the world championships will be there. And John, listen to this. If you start to imagine who some of the young paddlers are that are doing well, that could still be competitive at the 2042 World Championships, which I presume will be Laseo, you got little Estangue, little Josevar. They'll be in their mid-30s. Right, so you- it will be absolutely amazing. Like, I can't wait. I got to stick around. I got to find a way to stay on this planet and kind of be there in Laseo for the 50th anniversary of the 1992 Olympic Games. Yeah, you and me both, definitely. Uh, absolutely. Hopefully I'll still be doing this or something similar. Well, exactly. what, 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 what do you think hasn't changed since Tokyo? I mean, your, your point I take, yeah, it's only three years since Tokyo because it was delayed a year, but what hasn't changed? I think what hasn't changed so much, and I, of course you could ask this question to 10 different guests that appear on this podcast over the next couple of days and weeks, and you're going to get 10 different answers. I maybe it's just me getting a little bit old, older and kind of listening to voices like, you know, an Ettore Evaldi. But I think those calls for, I think, or sort of some of the observations about where the purity of Solom exists, where it shows up in the game today, where it's been lost. I think those kind of calls and that kind of conversation, the kind of the things that Ed Ray writes about in his blog posts, I think that have also been echoed here on this podcast is that uh, there definitely seems to be a, um, a not just a loud, but I think a pretty solidly large group of people that see some values in the sport of whitewater slalom that they would like to see uh, not be lost in the way the sport advances, that it, it actually that preserving some of these values of the sport and really doing this with a, some intentionality, with some real focus, will actually be the right way to advance the development of the sport. And so maybe that is something that I'm noticing and paying more attention to as well. No, no, that's a very, a very good point. I, I don't want to answer my own question, but I was thinking that it's many of the athletes and the names that are the same as they were three years ago. I mean, it doesn't, I mean, yeah. okay, so some new athletes have come in, but we've got four athletes that are at fifth Olympics. Was it five athletes that are there? Fourth Olympics, world number ones are still the same, world champions. So it's still the same, some of the same familiar faces that were winning in I, Tokyo. I I think I, I read on Ed Array's blog that I, I don't know that this has ever happened before or, but all four defending Olympic champions are back. I mean, like that is a unique situation for us, right? I mean, everyone who won gold in Tokyo will be competing in Paris. So um, that's pretty cool in itself also. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I, and also noted that the four world champions from Lee Valley, which was last year, are also in Paris oh. racing as well. You've got nine athletes that are at a fourth or fifth Olympics, but then you've got a whole new group uh it's their first olympic experience so in terms of performance at an olympic games does it favor those that have multiple experiences at an olympics or yeah is it the young gun who is going to be their first first olympic games i don't think it's exactly one or the other i think what i sort of pay more attention to whether it's experienced athlete or a newer athlete I think it's really how they work with themselves, how they are with themselves in the couple of days, couple of hours, couple of minutes, couple of seconds before they cross the start line. I think there's some advantages and disadvantages of both, right? I mean, I think a, a newer athlete can just uh, might have some ways to keep it playful and and not ha- not expect a lot and to go out and really just be great with their thoughts and make a really good performance. And then I think that there are a lot of um, athletes that have this experience, that have that patience, that have that that ability to kind of let the race come to them uh, a bit more. I don't think it's uncommon at the Olympics to see a very experienced athlete like my Allen to just kind of let the race come to her. And she did that. And that ended up amounting to a silver medal for her. And we saw some new breakout performances at the Olympics as well. And I, I just... I don't think it's so much new, the younger or the more experienced as much as 
I, I'm just always curious with like how people are with their thoughts and how they are in treating themselves um, and how they're handling themselves uh, in mindset and behavior in those um, in those remaining moments before they cross the start line at the Olympic Games. Okay, well, you, you and Tony S. Longay have another thing in common. You've both written a book. Uh, we talked about your book on one of these uh, episodes. And and yeah, I mean, a feature of that or a part of that book was that sitting on that start line and the potency yeah. of that and the focus. Yeah, I've I've often called the start line I practically live next to now in, in La Seille d'Urge, one of the most sacred spaces on earth that I've ever experienced. I think whitewater canoe slalom is so unique in that uh, you get a minute in that start area. Like you get 60 seconds by yourself alone. It's really special. You just kind of get to sort of absorb that moment. And I remember Jamie McEwen uh, talking about this bef- uh, in a conversation before the 1992 Olympics, just that feeling of him, of him pushing himself a- across the start line, not the finish line, but pushing himself across the start line was like one of the most relieving moments of your life. Like you're just so relieved to just have it, you know, be started. And and in back then in Los we didn't start right on the lip of the dam. There was a little sprint um, on the flat water before you went over the first drop. And that kind of gave you a few seconds to sort of process even in at top speed and in full motion, what this experience is all about. And then you get into sort of building up, building up, building up and getting into the white water, getting into the flow, finding your rhythm, hearing, uh, you, you know, your experience with the, with the crowd and, and the water. And, uh, and in my case with, with my canoe partner and yeah, I think that start line experience is just, is so, I think sacred is the word I kind of keep coming back to. Like it, for me, it was a moment to really be grateful and appreciative all those things about what I believe about the world, what I believe about myself, it's just stripped down to nothing. It's just you in the moment and that's it. Like you, you're just completely exposed to the world. So this is your moment to just go and enjoy what you've pr- practiced and prepared to do. And, and you go do that. And, and I, I think there's something to that. I think there's something that I try to appreciate about, everyone start at the Olympic games. And even as I see all these Instagram stories of new and young Olympians, I I keep thinking about them paddling across the start line and what that really means, not just at this moment, but what's this going to mean to them in 10 years, 15, 20 years when their life looks different, their roles in their life looks different. I I think that's such a special part of this. Yeah. It's also one of my favorite photographs or series of photographs. I mean, well, yeah, Canoe Swallow, and we have these epic kind of shots of the white water of that. But seeing that paddler focus just before the bleeps go off on those starting blocks, yeah, I, I, it, for me, is one of the most poignant photographs, and we've seen them through various Olympics. What are you looking forward to seeing uh, at the Olympics in Paris in Canoe Swallow? Or Kite Cross, or both? Oh, thank you for adding that context. I, yeah, I have to tell you, you know, having lived in Spain for the last seven years, and I love the athletes on the Spanish team. One story in particular that I think became really fun and got really interesting very recently was the uh, was the qualification of their quota in the uh, men's kayak cross by uh, Manu winning the 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 kayak cross race in Prague uh, and and getting the quota. Just before I left Laseo, I saw Manu, and I didn't expect it. He just kind of passed around the corner, and we stopped and talked. And I said, Manu, I, I'm pretty sure I know every Olympian that's competed for Spain, you know, at the Olympics in Slalom. I mean, it, it, it's we're a pretty small sport, small community. Are you the first Olympian from Galicia in Whitewater? And he said, I am. And I remember just before that World Cup in Krakow, because Spain used that next World Cup to help them decide who their kayak cross athlete was going to be. And I saw an Instagram story from Manu's club in Galicia, like 30 kids standing by the riverbank with a kind of a good luck message for him. For many years, John, in Spain, the canoe slalom, you either from San Sebastian 
Irun or Laseo, with maybe a couple of athletes, one or two from Ponce. It was Catalan and Basque. And it's been quite a journey to see Canoe Slalom expand around the country. And especially some of the athletes from Galicia, like Ainoa and Luis uh, Fernandez, and now Manu. It is a big deal, to, you know, for the clubs there, for the kids to know to be able to really have a relationship with someone that, that did it. They can look at Manu and say, if he can do it, maybe I can do it. So where is Galicia? And I think Galicia is in the far west part of Spain, uh, just above Portugal. It's a beautiful area of the country. It's a very unique culture. And I think, and by the way, it's done very well in flat water, in the flat water sprint racing. But now to see its development and progress and, and follow them. And I just think someone like Manu is, he has such a good heart. He's so kind. He's such a nice guy. I, I just see someone like this working hard to do everything he can to win a medal here at these Olympic Games and maybe again in Oklahoma City in four years. We'll see. But I think someone that will figure out a way to contribute and give back. And I think that kind of speaks to some of the, the pure values of the sport that we were talking about a little while ago that I think we're hoping to see more of. Like, getting that sense, that sense of connection uh, back to the roots of the sport in a more well-rounded, diverse way. I love seeing that here in this country. And that's something that makes me really happy about watching the development of Canoe Solomon in Spain. Yeah, not, I mean, not only Spain. I mean, Marlene, Jess Fox, Jury, I mean, there's so many have become incredible ambassadors for the global sport of canoe slalom and yeah i guess social media has uh allowed that network and influence to expand for sure i mean when we talk about jess like that is a different level of ambassadorship she is we, I, like i i think one thing i think it might be interesting to say a few things about jess and what i've noticed just what i've noticed watching um first i think the visibility of Jess and the way she shares and promotes her enjoyment of the sport so far beyond the, you know, the boundaries of the sport of canoe slalom. Like you really, Australians, all people in that part of the world really see and feel Jess's co connection to the sport, which I think is, is so good. Secondly, I mean, we are just watching the greatest of all time. Every time we see her compete, like, I remember feeling like this when I, there was a certain moment watching Michael Jordan play basketball where I, I was young and it was so clear, like I, I got to pay attention every time Michael Jordan touches the ball because I'm watching the greatest of all time. That's what I'm feeling when I see Jess now. And I think maybe one of the even evolutions that we're seeing about Jess is that yeah, I mean, you put a number on, uh, uh, you put the, the bib on, and you want to do well in every race. But I also think there's a lot of – she has a wonderful coach and her mom. She has a wonderful, wonderful coach and her mom. And it's just like you can all feel it leading to something of substance, all of the racing, all of the training. And, and I think Jess is just doing that at a different level and we've ever seen that before. That's That's been really, really cool to watch evolve over the last couple of years. Well, I remember at the Augsburg, well, just after the Augsburg World Cup this year, she commented about the fact that, yeah, it's hard, tough, competing, being on the start line in C1 women, K1 women, and kayak cross, so three disciplines. By Krakow, yeah. two races later, she proved that actually you can win all three in the same weekend. John, I hope everyone enjoys the games and uh, best wishes to all the athletes competing. I want to see everyone have the best experience they can at the games. Like that, that is the first and most important thing. Thank you for making the Olympics so special for all of us. That was Joe Jacoby. He represented USA at the Olympics in Barcelona and Athens. He talked to us from home in La Seo de Gel, Spain. Next, a short clip from double Olympian Mike Corcoran, also noting the poignancy of the Olympic start. Both Mike's daughters, Maddie and Michaela, are representing Ireland in Paris. This, the sport of canoe slalom is, is, a, is a life lesson and people don't realise it when they're doing it. 
because you know you're 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 pre- you're you know you're preparing for the race. You're preparing to be in good shape, and you're trying to learn. It's a it's a technical sport that you you know the more experience you have, uh, um, the better you are at it. You know you got to perform under stress. All these things really lead to uh, uh, life lessons that apply to life to to work to um stressful situations so i'm very proud my my kids are are um in the sport and you know going to the games i i know paddlers like i'm tight me and mark delaney are pretty tight We've, we come up together and you can look at someone on the river and you can say yes they have it no they don't you know there's a you can see uh, talent in in canoe slalom some some kids are really really good at at you know controlling their their nerves their conf you know they're confident it just it's i don't think it's even uh, something that you really can teach you, you learn it over time but i look at uh, hutch of our son you know i remember that kid uh, at the eca races and he's tiny and he he was cocky and full of confidence and i really think you know that along with he's very talented uh, is the whole uh, package right there you know my daughters are identical twins but they're very different in personality you know like extremely different do you remember being more excited or nervous about competing at the olympics yourself or about seeing your kids um competing in the olympics Ooh. I, I, I'll be honest with you. The, to me, the Olympics was like a performance. I had this feeling in Seo, especially uh, the first Olympics was like, okay, I've made it, and people are coming to see me perform. I'm going to try and put down a performance, you know. And that was, I was, I, I'm, I get more nervous for World Championships than I did Olympics. Uh, both Olympics, I was like, God, this is this is amazing, and, and it's an experience, and I'm going to cherish it. And the beauty that Sayo was, I don't know if you were there, from the from the village, which is basically a, a dorm, a school, you could walk to the course down these laneways completely on your own, right? In your own little world with your, with your Walkman and your music. And, you know, you could go in the back way into the course and you could, and, and I thought this was like, to me, it was like, really, really, I could be in my, I, there's no distractions, be in my own world. Uh, as far as nerves go, of course you're more nervous for your kids uh, than 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 yourself on the start line. I, I, Ian Wiley should have won the '92 Olympics, and I was I was like a bag of nerves for him watching him because no control. I wasn't nervous on the start line in Sayo, not at all, uh, which I thought was kind of interesting for me because I do normally, you know, be a little more kind of like. Uh, anxious, I'd say, until, you know, but both Olympics for me, nerves never played into it at all. It was, it was, it was kind of weird, actually, you know. What are you looking forward to? I mean, I know that you're traveling out to Vassaman. What are you looking forward to seeing there? I just want to sit in the stands and enjoy the whole, the whole race. It's a very, you know, like I haven't been to an Olympics since Atlanta. Okay. So I was competing, not, not spectating. Now, I mean, now that I got the, a different hat on as I just want to just enjoy, uh, the whole spectacle. I mean, we're going to the opening ceremony. Of course, I'm going to be super nervous for the, for the, for the girls. And, and, but I just want them to, you know, be on the start line and just relish that because it's uh it's not a fear and it, and it, it's uh it's an it's a, an experience that you know if you if this is it if this is the only olympic games you go to uh, you're very it's a very unique experience you're in a very unique position but it's something that is uh um very special even yeah. if it's nerve-wracking yeah. yeah i was talking to joe jacoby yesterday and yeah i mean being in those starting blocks at the start you remember this yeah it's oh, a very special moment clearly i remember uh, ike jacob you know ike uh he was my team manager he was a bag of nerves i'm in the start line like you know it's like 30 seconds ago he he's he's hovering around and i looked at him and said what are you doing you know i said just go away i'm fine and then and i went right you know so i mean that's yeah it, it stays with you forever I, the memories for sure and and again you know 
the beauty of this sport is it's you, it's your minute. It, there's 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 a real kind of uh, mental gem there, you know that that uh, that's you know um, I think it's really special. I think it's it, it, and it's hard to even like share that feeling with somebody because you know and it is different for everyone but it really is uh it's a very clear moment it, all, it has been for me right, anyway that was mike corcoran he represented ireland at the olympics in barcelona and atlanta he talked to us from washington dc usa as noted by joe jacoby we have all four defending olympic champions they are Ricarda Funk from Germany, Benjamin Savsek from Slovenia, Jess Fox from Australia, and Jiri Priskovic from the Czech Republic, as well as all four reigning world champions, Jess Fox from Australia, Benjamin Savsek from Slovenia, Mallory Franklin from Great Britain, and Joe Clark from Great Britain. World number ones in classic canoe slalom are Jess Fox in both canoe and kayak, Jiri Priskovic in men's kayak, and Luka Bozic from Slovenia. That illustrates a critical point. Representing Slovenia in Paris is defending Olympic champion and world number two, Benjamin Savsek. We benefited from a pre-Olympic test event in Vassemain with the final of the 2023 World Cup series. Two French winners, teenager Titouan Kastrick and double world champion Boris Nevu. Our other winners were Jess Fox, Rafi Ivaldi from Italy and Luca Jones from New Zealand. Leaders of the 2024 World Cup Series after three races, competing in Paris are Jess Fox, again in both canoe and kayak, plus Matty Benes from Slovakia in men's canoe. Finally, who did the athletes know as the most promising athletes after the last Olympics? At the end of the Rio Olympics, it was Jacob Grigar, Kubo. That proved a smart choice. He took silver for Slovakia in Tokyo. He is racing here as his third Olympics. On the last day of the Tokyo Olympics, the athletes voted Felix Oschmautz from Austria and Evie Liefarth from USA. Let's see. My pick was Aliska Mintelova from Slovakia. Thanks to my guests today, Joe Jacoby and Mike Corcoran. More from them both in upcoming episodes. Tomorrow's episode includes my conversation with Luka Bozic, previewing the C1 men and K1 women heats. If you need more, then look no further than Ntori Ivaldi's brilliant, insightful and eloquent blog. Link in the notes. Although written in his native Italian, technology allows us now to grasp his wonderful prose. I'm John Gregory. Thanks for listening. I'll be back in our next episode released tomorrow at 6am Central European time. That's it for now. Please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify or YouTube and leave a review too. Until the next episode, keep it fast and clean. Au revoir.